If you would please take your Bible and open to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2. Tonight we're going to talk about the false prophet, but we've got to see a little bit of where he comes from and uh, how he is going to work and the things that he is going to do uh, while he is here. Now, as, uh, as you and I full well know, the, uh, the next thing on God's calendar is, of course, the rapture and uh, of those that have put their faith and trust in Christ. Uh, and so uh, we call it the, the rapture of the church. We are living in what has been classified that uh, it's not really a necessarily a biblical term, but it is a, uh, it is a term that fits the criterion that we call the church age, basically is uh, how God is operating through the local New Testament church to accomplish his will. And, uh, oh, before I forget this, Carlos, can you help me out tonight? We need to, uh, I almost forget to take the offering. And so if you'll walk around and uh, if you've got an offering tonight, uh, the offering that is picked up on Wednesday night is our others offering. It goes to assist and help uh, others that may be in need. And so uh, if you've got an offering tonight, as Carlos comes around, uh, if you can just drop that in and that'll be a help uh, around for those that may be in help, that may be in need, whether it's a, a church that's in need or someone in particular. So uh, keep a, that in mind if you would. Daniel chapter number two, we have the events that Daniel is able to see. And uh, some of these things begin to trouble him somewhat. And in the process of that, God is able then to begin to reveal some things that are going to take place in the future. Now, Daniel was able to see some of these things that have not even taken place yet. It's hard for us to imagine that uh, how in the world could thousands of years ago uh, Daniel been able to see some of the things that still have not taken place? Well, that's God. God has no limits on time and he has no limits on space and matter and things of that nature. He just has no limits whatsoever. So he can, uh, he can show some of the things that are going to take place. Now you say, well, does that mean that uh, those things are ordained to take place because God has already planned them. And as I said, we're in this age right now that uh, uh, we don't know exactly when the Lord's going to come back. It's imminent. It's going to happen. We just don't know for sure when. And uh, there's been folks that have speculated down through the years. And it's, it's fun to listen to them. Uh, it's also, uh, it's, <laughs> but it's also one of those things where it's like, oh, I hope he's right. I hope they're right, but they usually end up being wrong. At least all of them have been up to this point. And then, because I, I think they try to use a, a method from scripture. It's like, there's something hidden in the scriptures. If you take the number of words in all, you know, and it's just, they try to use numerology and, and mathematics to figure things out. And, uh, and I think God just kind of chuckles a little bit. Uh, but uh, in that manner, uh, he does have a time that uh, the trumpet's going to sound and you and I are leaving, those that have put their faith and trust in Christ. Now, if you have not trusted Christ as Savior, you will be left behind. You say, well, th that would make God mean. No, God has done every single thing that he possibly could do. And uh, you will have to literally shake your fist in the face of God in order to remain here because he has done everything that he possibly can do. And uh, he's made a way and uh, he's made a, an opportunity for you and I that have, that have heard multiple times we are going to be without excuse. The truth is the scripture reminds us that Sodom and Gomorrah, those individuals that were there that were judged by God by fire, are going to rise up somewhat in judgment against the generation that is to come still. And so in that manner, they said, look, you've heard so many times, we didn't hear it as often as that. And so, uh, but uh, you and I have heard regularly and, uh, and so we would be certainly without excuse, but I'm grateful for the day that uh, the Lord Jesus impressed upon my heart that I need to trust him as Savior. And the second that I bowed there on February 23rd, 1981, to trust him as my Savior, uh, that day changed my entire life. And I hope whatever day that you uh, trusted Christ as Savior, it's changed yours too. Daniel chapter number two, God is beginning to reveal to Daniel some things that are going on. And he sees this magnificent uh, image that is, uh, that is there. And uh, God begins to give him some definition about some of those things. And some of that definition uh, of that uh, in image was there with Daniel's 70 weeks are still yet to come. So if, look, if you would please, in chapter number two, uh, look at verse number 28. I'll have to read very, very quickly, so stay with me if you would please. 
Beginning in verse number 28, the Bible says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So we know that it is still yet to come in that manner. Thy dream and the visions of the head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came unto thy mind upon thy bed that thou should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secret maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So God did not have scripture at that time that was easily as easily acquired as you and I. So he would oftentimes use dreams. God does not use a great deal of them today because he has a complete uh, revelation of scripture and the Holy Spirit indwells us right now. Holy Spirit did not act the same way in the Old Testament as he does in the New Testament. And so in that manner, there is a difference uh, of how God speaks. So if you say, well, I had a dream and God spoke to me, it's not the fact that God cannot do that, but chances of that are pretty slim. It was probably the pepperoni pizza you ate before you went to bed that's speaking to you a little bit. Believe me, all of us have had odd and weird dreams. It's like, what in the world does that mean? Sometimes it's because of medications. Sometimes you've taken a good shot of NyQuil and next thing you know, you see things. And, uh, but uh, in that manner, God usually uses the, the scripture to accomplish his will today. And uh, so let's move down just a little bit further. Verse number 31 says this, Thou, O king, sawest, and, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was a uh, fine gold, his, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of the iron and part of clay. Now, you and I need to take note of that very last part that was just mentioned right there. And he begins to explain some of these things because he says in verse 33, his legs of iron and his feet, part of iron and part of clay. And uh, so as he goes on and begins to define some of these things and give us some clarity of them and tells a little bit, let's look at verse number uh, 38. And uh, wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of heaven have given unto thee hands and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of, of gold. So he's beginning to give some definition. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar at that time was the head of gold. He goes on to say, verse 39, and after these uh, shall arise another king, a kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of the potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as it sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. As for the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, thou shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Uh, verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, the, the part of this last part of the is, uh, uh, of course, we know as we go down through it, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the head, Babylonian. And then uh, uh, the, the next, uh, the Grecian Empire that came. After that, the world power was the Roman Empire. The very last part of this is the feet. Now the feet are divided. Now, and we'll have to look at this because remember last week that I said that the, uh, uh, the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, that is the unholy trinity that is going to be upon this earth of that day, had 10 kingdoms. The feet have 10 toes. And the Bible reminds us that here it is divided. This is going to be what is considered or what is called the revived Roman Empire because it comes from that European area. Now, we're going to look at some more scripture that define a little more closely on why it is called the revived Roman Empire. Now, we know that it is iron. So the, the Roman Empire was that iron that was there. It was very strong. You remember that, uh, and of course, uh, the Lord used that very thing that, uh, that Rome uh, ruled the world of that day. The Romans road basically made free travel for all the people that was, and the Romans protected it. And God used that. We even use that term, the Romans road of salvation. Uh, it was just a clear path that was given. Of course, we use the book of Romans. That's why we use that. But uh, when scripture says that all roads lead to Rome, there was a reason for that. The apostle Paul used that very thing. Uh, and so 
In that manner, we need to understand that this revival of an empire in the end times, in the end days, is going to be set up with these ten kings. It's going to be divided, as Scripture says, as we've already looked at some of them, and there's going to be one individual that's going to rise out of that, which is going to be uh, the Antichrist. We know it is going to come from the European Union in that manner because we understand that the iron that is there uh, is still forming along those lines. Now, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of conjecture, there's a lot of things, and some of the things that I'll mention tonight, you say, well, I thought it might be this. The truth is, we don't have perfect definition of all the things. It is a culmination of the things that have to be put together. Does other have uh, more clarity because of more study? Oh, certainly there are. But understand this, these last 10 toes that are there are representing 10 kingdoms that are going to somewhat rise to rule the world of this day. And uh, now, you and I are not gonna be here uh, we're going to be in the, in the air with the Lord, as the, uh, Scripture says, but we are going to come back because, as it said in verse number 44, uh, there is going to come a stone that's going to crush all of these, and that's going to be God himself. The Lord Jesus is going to return that second coming when he literally puts his feet back on this earth, and he's going to put down the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of them, and uh, hopefully we can get to that uh, this evening. But understand this. This vision has been seen now thousands of years before. We know uh, up to this point that the Lord has not returned. The trumpet sounds and then all the things that are in scripture have already, a number of them have been set in place. There's not gonna be a whole lot of negotiation because the Holy Spirit's task and his working upon the earth of that day is not complete, but it is going to be hampered in that manner. And uh, because scripture reminds us the very second that, uh, by the way, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He doesn't live in this building. He's not uh, an ethereal individual that just kind of floats around. He, is, uh, he lives inside you and I. That's where he resides. He tabernacles, scripture says, in us. And so he is literally uh, living there. It's hard for us to imagine that. But if I can say that you and I are somewhat possessed, we are. Uh, now, if we can only surrender to his will and his working, we're going to be a whole lot better off uh, because he is always going to do what is right, remind us of the Savior and do those things. They're going to be beneficial and remind us of, of Scripture. And so, uh, but in that manner, he is there. He is here. Now, the second that the, the rapture takes place, the trumpet sounds, we're taken out along with the, the Holy Spirit's working. Now, are, are, are there still going to be Scripture that are here on this earth? Yes, there are. Is there going to be truth that has already been proclaimed that people have heard? Yes. Uh, and by the way, God is going to send messengers. He's going to send people to, to uh, the task of getting the gospel uh, to the, the people that are here. And so there is going to be people that are saved and, uh, uh, and that do trust Christ uh, as Savior. Uh, is it likely? Not as much as it is today. Uh, because uh, there is going to be strong delusion that is sent their way. And a lot of people are going to believe a lie. The truth is they're going to be following the individual we're going to look at tonight, the false prophet. And so uh, now, so we want to accentuate. I just need you to understand that the kingdoms that are rising are coming as a revived Roman Empire. It began uh, and explained somewhat in Daniel. It's going to come from that European Union. So a lot of that, uh, and when I use that, that term, it's going to come from that Europe area. Uh, but it's going to influence a lot of people in the world of that day. And so if you would please now, take your Bible and turn to Revelation. We're going to turn back to Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. This false prophet, so understand the very nature of uh, what he is saying is this. Since he is going to be a prophet, that means that he is going to make predictions and he is going to lead, if you would, the instance of, uh, okay, the, the, the Antichrist and the beast, if you want to put it in that manner, is going to operate governmentally. He is going to come to influence governmentally. And uh, we understand that uh, the government is supposed to help uh, keep things organized somewhat so that civil uh, things will stay that way. There's not going to be a whole lot of civil obedience during this time. There's going to be a whole lot of chaos and a whole lot of difficulties. So people are going to be looking to somebody that can maybe bring some understanding to the chaos that's going on. The Antichrist is going to be working in that individual, the beast, if you would, is going to come as the government leads. Now, you learned just a few years ago how quickly people will go along with things and do such crazy things uh, when, when 
somebody makes an, an occasion of, oh, well, you could lose your life. Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, 100% guaranteed, every last one of you and I, if the trumpet doesn't sound, we will lose our life. Guaranteed. We're going to. Now, when? We want to try to prevent that, of course. And uh, we want to try to keep those things from happening. Uh, but as I said before, sometimes the government does not get it right. They just don't. And you, cannot, you can do the best you can to try to rely on them uh, to some degree, but they're not very reliable. They're not. And uh, uh, I, I think it's interesting uh, because I, I believe it was Mr. Reagan that said one of the craziest things is the statement that is made, uh, we are the government, we are here to help. <laughs> and it's like a, those two don't usually go very well together. And uh, now hopefully uh, in this instance, there's certainly not going to be the case because this individual that is going to rise in power out of these 10 kingdoms uh, is going to be one that is, is trying to bring some civility to things that are going on, the chaos that has taken place monetarily and just uh, all over the world. But there is also going to be, you understand the folks that are politically, they are driven politically. They are, they are I mean, they're, uh, let me put it like this. There comes a point in the verses that we're going to read here that the uh, false prophet is going to ask you and I to follow along, no questions asked. Now, not me. I'll put it like this. I'm not going to be here. But he is going to require devotion politically with no questions asked. Now, isn't that strange that we understand how quickly and how easily that takes place even today? There is no way that somebody could look at our, our governmental stance and the individuals sometimes that are doing what they do, say what they say. Uh, okay, here, here's, my, here's my political stump tonight, all right? One of, the, uh, one of the individuals that is running for office has already been in office for a number of years and has done absolutely nothing, and yet we're to believe that they're going to do something now? You know, I, I was born on A Day, but it wasn't yesterday. And so in that manner, there is a whole lot of deception that's going on, and people are just following blindly. It's like, how in the world could you believe that that would be the case? I, I, it's fun to watch the interviews. Who are you, and the man on the street, who are you voting for? They say who they're voting for, and then they ask why. Uh, one man even said, uh, don't use this. Don't use this interview. <laughs> it's one of them. Uh, no kidding. When logic comes into play and when a little bit of realization of, of what's going on, but the false prophet is going to demand that type of following. They're going to demand that religiously and they're going to demand it to a point that they're going to say, uh, you're going to take a mark. And that's the way that you're going to buy and sell. And if you don't, you are not going to buy and sell. Sound familiar? Look, there were some of us that had already determined if it comes to a point that the workplace says, you have to do this or you can't work here, I was willing to, I had already written things out and said, uh, you're not going to require me to put something in or on my body in order to buy and sell according to scripture, and I'm going to stand on that. I didn't want to. I really didn't. I prayed and said, Lord, I hope that's not the case. I really don't. I don't want that to be the case here in America. I don't. But there's some people that had to face that over and over again and I had to face that very circumstance and uh, and that's exactly what's going to take place in the end times notice if you would please in revelation chapter number 13 beginning in verse number 11 the bible says and i beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb isn't that interesting because <laughs> uh, he's going to come with influence but he's coming as a lamb the reason being is he is false. He is going to be the false Christ, if you would, to, uh, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. So the, the job of this false prophet is to draw attention to the beast or the antichrist, if you would, and the, he's going to uh, require devotion and worship. Now, we understand very clearly that the worship means God has already stated, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The only person you're supposed to worship is going to be the Lord Almighty. But in that instance, there's going to be some occasions where, you know, if we was to really whittle it down a whole lot, uh, when God says that he's a jealous God, it's for a reason. One, because you aren't going to get your prayers answered anywhere else. And number two, anything that takes the place of God or that he has to rival for that uh, when he's not the priority means that you and I are allowing idolatry to get into our life. 
If anything, if, if God has to grapple for any of our time or priority in our life uh, in that manner, he is not, uh, he, he, he's just a jealous God. He, he shouldn't have to do that. But as we go on just a little bit further, so they're requiring worship uh, whose deadly wound was healed. Verse number 13. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which uh, had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused, uh, isn't it interesting that he now, if you're not willing to worship, they're willing to kill you. Verse number 16, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, the reason being is we know what we call the, the mark of the beast in this particular manner because it gives us, now, you understand very clearly how easy that is today. Matter of fact, I, uh, I don't know an individual, but I've seen it. Uh, they've put uh, uh, chips in their hand. It's a medical chip to, that it can, be, uh, can be scanned so that it has all their medical information right there, and it can be added to and taken from. I also know uh, uh, that they make also locks that are, uh, biometrically, if you want to put it like that, not just your handprint, but it ha you have a chip in your hand. You go to reach for the door and it'll unlock. Anyone else cannot unlock it. And so uh, there's a lot of things that are going along those lines that they're able to do now. And uh, uh, if you want to put it like that, technology has caught up to some of these things. And, uh, and so in that manner, it goes on to tell us that they're going to have either in your hand or your forehead. It goes on to say in verse number seven, and that no man might buy or sell save he that hath the mark, or the number of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Now that is six, six, six. And so there is going to be that number of a man, the understanding in that manner. Uh, now, whether it's going to be visible or not, it doesn't give clarity on that but it is going to be in the place of your forehead or on the hand. Now, my understanding is, and I was trying to look this up a little bit more, during Roman times, if you did not worship Caesar, uh, the only way that you were going to transact some things is if you had basically that verification that you, were all, you had the authority to trade. And some of that was if you're carrying things, the mark was here, or if you're exchanging money, it was on your hand. Now, I've tried to look those things up just a little bit more, and, uh, and I can't find, uh, there's some that say that that was the case during some of the Roman times, and others say that that wasn't, and so I, I can't verify that completely. But in that manner, we know that during the end times, after the rapture takes place, that this false prophet is going to require that mark so that you and I will, uh, excuse me, not you and I, sorry about that, but those that are here uh, are going to have, well, I don't know, some of you may still be here, but uh, uh, I have no idea. Uh, but in that manner, uh, it, there is going to be the case where uh, the individuals that are here are only going to be able to transact business if they take that mark. And if they choose not to, they will be killed. And so uh, in that, uh, we see here that this false prophet is going to require devotion without question. He is going to require that to a point that he says, all right, you're going to do it and you're going to make sure that this is the case because you're going to put a mark on you. You're going to put something on your body that uh, is going to verify that you have accepted this. You've, so to speak, bowed the knee. You're going to worship the beast. And so in that manner, that image is the case. So the false prophet is going to initiate part of this mark that is going to be there. Take your Bible, if you would, please, now and turn over to chapter number 16. Revelation chapter number 16. There is the instance where he is uh, also going to have power to do the things that Scripture just said in chapter number 13, uh, to call fire down from heaven and do those things. Uh, but he is also instrumental during those vials that are there that Brother Starr talked about. Uh, look at verse number 13, if you would, please. The Bible says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So in this manner, these, uh, these spirits that are coming out, understand something, frogs, uh, they're a little bit eerie, but they're pretty subtle. Usually they don't make a whole lot of noise till you get close to them and then they may jump or something or another. 
And as I said, as uh, the back door that's over here gets those little tree frogs, and uh, and I opened the door even today. I opened the door and one splatted down on the grass. Well, he didn't land on me anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, but the frogs don't don't scare me a great deal. Frogs are very subtle. What he's saying is this: these spirits are going to be very subtle, and uh, the false prophet is oftentimes going to be just that. He's going to be somewhat calm and subtle. And he's going to have that demeanor of everything will be okay, everything will be all right, while he's, while he's sliding a knife in your back, so to speak. And so uh, he is going to be instrumental in this instance. And uh, in other words, here's the phrase, nothing here to see, nothing here to see. These uh, spirits like frogs are just going to be very, uh, very calm, very simple, and very, uh, very nonchalant, very subtle. And so uh, they're going to be very deceptive at that time. So that's exactly uh, what's going to take place. Now, the next part, uh, so he's going to be instrumental in allowing the, the spirits that are going to go forth and, uh, and cause difficulties because in verse number 14 it says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Because their task is now to deceive and to bring falsehoods against God and make him the enemy. So that's going to be their task. Now, the next thing that we see is in chapter number 17. Chapter number 17 begins the false prophet's explanation of where he's going to get his authority and where that authority is going to reside. The truth is, it's going to, I'm going to have to move a little bit quickly here. Or I'm going to run out of time. Uh, well, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, we'll pick up those things on next Wednesday. Let me take some time to develop things in chapter number 17 because these, this is the instance where you and I can see and reflect just a little bit of where some of the authority of this false prophet is going to come from. So I want you to notice in uh, chapter number 17, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now, remember this. The Roman Empire came from... Somebody want to guess where the Roman Empire came from? Rome. They came from Rome. All right. Did anybody know where Rome is? Italy, and so uh, you, I don't want to tell you what else is in Rome and in Italy, but uh, maybe we can figure that out here in just a few minutes. Beginning, <laughs> some of you are already smiling, so like, oh, you're going to say it, aren't you? I just might. I just might. Yes, I am. So uh, there ain't no reason not to. It's right here in Scripture. Verse number one, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, come hither. I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So he is now going to reveal to uh, John uh, some of the things. Uh, in other words, all these, all these vials and all these judgments are being poured out. He says, but let me show you some of the things that's going to happen during this time. So he begins to uh, pull back the curtain just a little bit. Uh, and by the way, in scripture, oftentimes a pure woman represents good religion and a, a bad woman represents false religion. So when scripture begins to define this individual and uses the term harlot or whore, he is oftentimes talking about a false religion because that's the way scripture oftentimes refers to those individuals uh, at times. All right, verse number two. So in other words, so we're understanding now when he uses the term whore, he is talking about a false religion that is here on this earth right now. Verse number two, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have, ma uh, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, been completely deceived and has taken it in and constantly taking it in and, uh, and uh, have just been deceived by that. Verse number three, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. So in other words, now there's going to be some royalty, some regalia, some hierarchy. There's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of things that have uh, just that, uh, what, 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 what term am I looking for? Uh, just a, just a, and I want to use the term royalty, but that's not necessarily the case. There's just going to be the, uh, the essence of there is, uh, th there's a, a hierarchy. There's a pecking order. How do I want to put it like this? The, what's that? Yeah, maybe that's good. Maybe there's a prestige to some of these things. Uh, it starts off with a pointy hat and goes down to a regular hat until it, uh, well, well, maybe, a, and so that's just the way it works. And so, uh, but in other words, there is the element uh, where there is uh, occasions where uh, very, 
very rich robes are being used and very, uh, very hierarchy regalia, in other words, uh, to take note of individuals that, that are in this religious realm. And so he begins to use that, uh, and he explains that. They, uh, uh, I saw a woman, okay, this woman, of course, is that false religion, set upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. There it is again. There's that number ten once again. So that uh, this number is showing up over and over again because there's such a close correlation between uh, the kings of this earth and the one that is ruling and those ten kings that are going to be uh, and those end times. Verse number four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and, and pearls having a golden cup and a ring on their finger that had to be kissed more often than what it should be. Oh, that's not what that says. It just says, and in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. No, that's literally what it means. That is literally saying that. It's saying the devotion that is giving in that manner. Now, uh, in that, it is, Scripture is, is revealing those things in that manner. And uh, that's why uh, even the angels, uh, there were times that, that they would bow down. Even in the book of Revelation and Daniel, the, the person would fall down and they'd say, don't worship me. I'm just sent as a messenger. You worship God. And by the way, that's all the way that righteousness always is. That's why when people fell down to worship Jesus, he could accept it because he is God. And uh, now they got upset with him because they said, that's blasphemy. And he said, it's not blasphemy. And uh, in that manner, uh, even, on, even the day that he was being crucified, Pilate said, you're called a king. He said, that's what you say. And uh, because he said, I'm not proclaiming kingdom and I'm not proclaiming a king. I'm coming as a lamb. You're the one that's saying that. And in that manner, he said, and that's why Jesus never one single time asked anybody to wash his feet. Never did. Now he did. He washed people's feet all the time. He made it very clear, even when, even when he came to Peter. And uh, Peter said, you're not washing my feet. That's a servant's job. For the most part, that's what he said. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, I don't have any part with you. And he said, well, then just wash me all over. <laughs> he said, Jesus said, no, you don't need that. You just need, need me to make sure. He was a servant. He didn't come as, a, he came as a lamb and he came as one to serve. And that's what he did. He never required anybody to kiss his hands. He never required anybody to kiss his feet. Now, did they? Oh, yeah. There's time that Mary came and broke that alabaster box and, uh, and wiped his feet with, with her hair and with that ointment and anointed him in that manner. And, uh, and he allowed her to do that. But that was not something he required by any stretch of the imagination. Never did. Now, one day, we, we're going to want to do that. And he will allow that. And uh, that's going to be a wonderful day it is. But I want you to notice, if you would please, the abominations that are stated at this time. Because now, all the curtains are pulled back. Nobody's holding anything back. Look at verse number five, and the Bible says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now that's something. And it's not, believe me, if somebody's going to wear that title and wear that name proudly, I don't think that's a very positive thing. But now they're not holding anything back. They're just letting it known. And, uh, and so in that manner, there's not, I'm, it's, I'm not trying to hide anything. This is what I've done. This is who I am. And that's exactly what is being stated at that time. I don't, you and I would look at it it's like, yeah, that's not really a shirt I think we ought to wear. But they were wearing it proudly. Verse number six. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carry her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. And so in that manner, isn't it interesting that these ten unions are now supporting her, taking care of her, and literally uh, make, uh, giving her transportation, so to speak. Now, I've got to stop here, but the truth is I'll explain a little bit more about this false prophet and some of the things that are going on because there's definition that is given to us in the next few verses in chapter number 17 and we want to take some time to look at that. Let's all stand. I said, preacher, I don't like what you said. 
Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I'm getting to a point where anymore it's like, eh, I, I have my own pains. I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> and so, uh, but scripture, strip, scripture is still true. It just is. Whether we like it or not, it's true. And so we just have to accept what God has said. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for your gracious kindness and mercy. And Lord, I thank you again for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the salvation that you've provided. We read about things that we'll never partake in, and I'm so grateful because of you. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now as we recognize the fact that there will be a time when that trumpet sounds. There will be friends, loved ones that we know that are probably going to be left behind. God, I do ask that you'd please help us to be diligent, help us to do our task. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just work to accomplish your will in Jesus' name. Amen.